Okay, well, uh, thank you very much, John, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here and talk about uh, the total artificial heart, which is, as you can see in this slide, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, sort of where it came from and, and where it stands now without going into the more recent data, which will be covered by uh, some of the other speakers, but you can see uh, on this slide, or the intention of this slide, let me say, is to show that the syncardia, uh, formerly called Cardio West Total Artificial Heart, uh, has been approved uh, uh, since uh, 2004 by the FDA. It's the only total artificial heart to ever be approved by the FDA. It's been approved by CMS for uh, uh, funding. Uh, payment uh, through uh, uh, Medicare and so forth since 2008. And uh, <clears throat> there have been uh, approximately 2,000 implants. You can see the, uh, so this briefly shows you the history of the Syncardia total artificial heart. So I was just a heart transplant surgeon. I didn't really have much interest in mechanical circulatory support except that uh, patients had died and I was uh, after heart transplant uh, acutely and I was at a loss as to what to do for them at that time. And our first case was we used an uh, unapproved heart called the Phoenix heart uh, just to show what how we uh, utilized devices back in those days. And I start this, these, this slide starts with 1985 on the left side and it goes to uh, 2006. And it shows the percent of patients each year that either got a uh, total artificial heart in red, a LVAD in light blue or a BIVAD in dark blue. And uh, the first couple of years we had nothing but total heart, so that's what we put in. And then gradually we started using a combination of the three, uh, both the total artificial heart, the BIVAD and the LVAD oh, yeah. until 1991. When, as I said, the FDA withdrew this device from use in the United States. And what we found interestingly enough in essentially the same patient population using LVADs and BIVADs is that the mortality rate went way up in our patient population. We were using this device uh, or these devices in very sick patients who had who rapidly decompensated and uh, had biventricular failure. And uh, by 1992, 1993, the total artificial heart came back. We had sort of rebound enthusiasm and did nothing but total heart for a couple of years. And then as things uh, uh, settled out over the years, we sort of put a about a total artificial heart in about a third of the patients that we thought deserved a mechanical circulatory. Also the national study that we did to get the uh, uh, investigational device exemption approved uh, is essentially the, the main slide is shown right here. It's the survival over time of those that had a total artificial heart compared to a control group of about uh, 40 patients who did not have any device support at all. And you can see uh, that the curves are parallel and that corresponds to the time of transplant. Hardly anybody in the control group got a transplant and about 80% of the patients in the total artificial heart group got a transplant. And then they went on and had a five-year survival of over uh, 50% and something close to 60%. Next slide. So why, why uh, did we see uh, this recovery and a good result with the total artificial heart? Well, it pumps a lot of blood. Uh, cardiac index uh, went from uh, 1.9 to 3.2 in the post-implant group. The systolic pressure rose, as you can see, 93 to 122. One thing that's really key in this whole business of biventricular support is the CVP. The CVP fell uh, from 20 pre-implant to 14. And if the CVP goes down, of course, we know the kidneys get perfused and the liver gets perfused and the organ perfusion pressure is increased. And it went up from 48 to 68. So uh, what we saw was renal and hepatic function 
in this group of patients returned uh, with it. Emphasize the CVP because the CVP is uh, one of these underrated and overlooked things uh, in deciding whether biventricular failure exists or not. But if you carefully check most papers on LVADs, you'll find that the mean CVP is less than 16. And most of the time it's around 12. In most of the studies that have been published on LVAD implants. And it's known that with a CVP of greater than 16, uh, that's an independent risk factor for mortality uh, after putting in a device. So central venous pressure is something that's very important in my opinion. Next slide. This just shows the history of the total artificial heart in terms of number of implants per year with respect to time. And this goes out to about 2015 uh, when 147 implants were done worldwide. And you can see there, there wasn't a whole lot of activity until the device got approved by the FDA. So we went from 82 uh, to 2004 before there was a rise in activity. And that's because nobody else could put it in. Uh, they weren't allowed to. And then when the portable driver came along and patients could be discharged from the hospital and the cost of the implant could be reduced, then there was a bump up in, uh, in the usage of the device. Next, please. So uh, this is kind of uh, my final stab at the total artificial heart talk. And it's, it's my uh, impression of how patients should be selected for a total artificial heart. That's, the, that's really the big key question about this device now. You know, does it have a place? I'm totally convinced that it does and would if people would just give it a try. Uh, the first is acute irreversible myocardial failure or shock in a potential transplant patient. Remember, this device is approved for bridge to transplantation. So it has to be somebody who is either a candidate or could be a candidate for transplantation. Biventricular failure, and what, how, do you dis, how do you diagnose biventricular failure? I just let the cat out of the bag on the last couple of slides, but if for my money, a CVP of greater than 16 in a patient who's on maximal medical therapy and you can't get the CVP below 16, you've got right ventricular failure. Uh, there are other ways of looking at it. None of them have been particularly great. Echo, nuclear first pass studies of right ventricular ejection, MRI, none of that has helped nearly as much in my mind as just looking at a simple CVP in the maximally treated patient. Now, another thing you need to look for in these patients is absence of neurologic injury, particularly in patients who are transferred into your hospital and where you are sort of stuck, you're where the buck stops and you've got to do something for this patient or just let him go. And a head CT is an absolute requirement also for anybody that's had an acute cardiac arrest or a sudden decompensation, they, they are, uh, candidates for a head CT to make sure there's nothing that's irreversible. And it can become of importance from a medical legal point of view, uh, as well as from a strictly biologic and patient care point of view. Finally, adequate fit criteria. This device doesn't fit everybody, but it fits a lot of people. And if their left ventricular internal diastolic dimension is greater than 70 millimeters or seven centimeters. And if the sternum to uh, vertebral body distance at T10 is greater than 10 centimeters, then the chances are this uh, heart will fit. And uh, there are a number of other criteria. And it's all well written up in articles that uh, summarize uh, the total artificial heart. But these are the two main ones, and uh, they're for the 70 ml ventricles. Now, there is a smaller total artificial heart with 50 ml ventricles. And uh, so it's probably about one third less than that. But, you know, we don't really have uh, rigid criteria yet. And then we do have the virtual uh, sizing available 
using CT scanning and three-dimensional uh, uh, virtual uh, sizing. So that's another option as well. Next slide. Uh, here's a guy. Uh, this, is, this is why I think uh, total artificial heart is certainly a viable uh, thing at, at the present time. You can see he's playing basketball. He's got his total artificial heart portable driver in his backpack. Uh, and he had uh, uh, right ventricular dysplasia uh, syndrome, a familial uh, condition, uh, not too common. But when the right ventricular goes and they start having uh, VTAC and VFib, uh, they need uh, as something to replace both ventricles unless you have a transplant waiting right away. Next. Um, let's see. Uh, so just a quick uh, recap of the history. That's Barney Clark. Yeah. Barney Clark was the uh, patient that received the permanent implant by Bill DeVries. You see Bill DeVries there, big handsome guy with Barney Clark, the dentist, and Barney lived for 112 days and actually did amazingly well considering uh, the, the fact that we knew nothing about anticoagulation sizing and other factors at the time. 2000 patients have been supported, uh, ages from nine to 80 years old uh, with a wide variation in body surface areas. 720 patient years of support. Uh, that's a lot of support in these patients and 80% uh, that have been implanted have been either profile one or profile two intermax as I said, or, or I, did, I guess I didn't say, in that initial study that we did, uh, it turned out about 90% were uh, profile one. That fellow that got the first successful bridge to transplant shown there, uh, sitting down, and uh, the team, uh, including Mark Levinson and Rich Smith, uh, there with him. And then uh, 2015, another man out there teaching his uh, wife or daughter to, to shoot a bow and arrow. Very good, thank you, Joe. Next slide, please. We have uh, two different sizes of artificial heart and Dr. Copeland pointed out very uh, well that the 70 cc total artificial heart is generally for uh, patients who have a BSI above 1.8 and one of the uh, sizing factors that we used also is looking at the lateral view at the T10 level from spine to sternum and anything above 10, the 70 cc usually fits. And if you have any doubt of that, uh, you can also send us a CT scan and we do a virtual three-dimensional fit trial which we can optimize whether the 70 cc or the 50 cc device is the correct one to use. Our smallest patient with a 50 cc device had a 1.16 uh, body surface area. So it is clearly, the 50 cc is clearly designated for patients that uh, of a smaller stature, uh, small women um, or uh, adolescent uh, patients. And Joe showed the, uh, the bridge to transplant in the uh, adolescent ages, extremely high, very good. Next slide. Uh, quick mention, uh, the 50 cc artificial heart and the 70 cc artificial heart are both FDA approved devices as a bridge to transplant. And you see on the right hand side of the slide, the two drive systems the, uh, the, the driver system with the, the screen and the large cart, that's the hospital driver. And the one in the smaller wheeled caddy, that is also the same companion driver. And it bears mentioning that the controlling aspect of the 50 and the 70 are identical. And when the patient is hemodynamically stable, they are able to be transitioned to what you see in the upper right-hand portion, the Freedom Portable Driver. And the patients wear that in a backpack or a shoulder bag and can go outside of the hospital uh, for both the 50 and the 70 cc artificial heart. Next slide. 
the mechanism of control is uh, it, it's, it's almost magical, so to speak. Uh, in the hand side of the slide, the two drive systems, the, uh, the, the driver system with the, the screen and the large cart, that's the hospital driver. And the one in the smaller wheeled caddy, that is also the same companion driver. And it bears mentioning that the controlling aspect of the 50 and the 70 are identical. And when the patient is hemodynamically stable, they are able to be transitioned to what you see in the upper right-hand portion, the Freedom portable driver. And the patients wear that in a backpack or a shoulder bag and can go outside of the hospital uh, for both the 50 and the 70 cc artificial heart. Next slide. The mechanism of control is, uh, it, it's, it's almost magical, so to speak. Uh, it is hemodynamically uh, uh, reactive to the patient's uh, activity level. We achieve this by controlling the artificial heart to give a partial filling of the ventricle during diastole, always, re le always leaving a little bit of residual space for uh, additional volume to come into the device. And then at, during systole, we completely eject all of the blood. By having this partial filling mechanism, it very closely mimics the Frank Starling effect. So as the patients get up and exercise, the artificial heart automatically will provide additional cardiac output. And the operator does not need to make any changes to the drive system. Uh, one thing that also bears mentioning is that uh, the drive systems that we are using uh, actually are, are very uh, much, a, very easy to manage. You do not need to manage the device. It's virtually set it and forget it. And then you just manage the patient's uh, medical needs. Next slide. So the increasing venous return will cause a great higher filling volume. And because we eject all of the blood that came in on each cycle, you, you do have that starling principle that does affect the output of the, of the artificial. I've designated four separate phases of, of uh, training. Phase one training is where the surgical team and the cardiology team will come for an animal implant of the device. Phase two is where we travel to the hospital and train the larger portion of the uh, caregivers in the hospital. Phase three is where we have identified a patient and we implant that patient at the hospital. We will have a certified proctor be on site as well as the clinical care specialist. And then when that patient is ready to transition to the Freedom Driver, that's when we train on all of the aspects of the Freedom Driver. And then the patient can go out of the hospital if, uh, if that's the plan, and then they can come back in for the transplant. Next. So the next section, we're gonna have Dr. Erbia talk uh, in detail about patient selection and, and uh, the management of the patients. Dr. Erbia. Thank you very much, Steve, and thank you for the opportunity to participate. I'll be talking to you about patient selection, which is what appears to be very straightforward, and it is in some degrees, but it's also very confusing to many people. Uh, the, sometimes the knowledge on how to do this is not there, but it's more than the knowledge, so you just experience. And, and once you have the experience, actually becomes fairly straightforward. So in the refinement in patient selection and timing, there are a few things that are very important. You have to be able to select the right device for the right patient at the right time. And although that sounds very simple, it's very difficult, given the whole armamentarium of devices that are available at this time. But keys to optimizing the outcomes are you have to be able to identify the patient with biventricular failure who is not improving with medical therapy, meaning the right side is not improving, either despite uh, medical management or despite a short-term device, for example, on the left side, and the right side continue to, uh, to fail. One of the things that I 
uh, try to uh, train people not to do is this concept of uh, the progression of MCS in short-term devices, something that I call titrating devices. We like to try to titrate medications and anotrop, that's fairly straightforward. Titrating devices, every time you escalate to a new device, you add a mortality and a morbidity with it. <clears throat> so I try to encourage people not to do that and go straight to the device that is really gonna make the difference. So you have to make sure that your end organ function in the patients are, is adequate, that the organs have not deteriorated. Once they start to deteriorate, either with medical management or short-term devices, we're falling behind uh, and the mortality for that patient is in increasing even if you do a TAA. One important thing to remember about the TAA is that it, the artificial heart is not a rescue device like an egg bomb. Sometimes people tend to think just wait until the patient is almost dead to put a TAH, and that usually brings no good outcome. So just keep that very uh, in, the, in your mind. So when you decide that you have to do something and you're gonna do an artificial heart, the sooner the better. I have seen many times that the devices are actually scheduled for one or two weeks later, when we know already that the patient is doing very ill. Well. That doesn't help the patient. In some patients, there is no doubt they require some temporary support. And what do we know about this? Well, from the Intermec database, 20% of the patients who got a TAA were supported by ECMO. And what do we know about ECMO and TAA is that uh, it appears, and this was from a retrospective study that was done at Cedar sinai several years ago, that the longer you wait on, the, on ECMO, for example, the, the, out, the outcome is probably gonna decrease. Although the paper from uh, that was published just a few months ago, combining six medical centers that showed no evidence of, the, no difference in survival between the ECMO and the non-ECMO group. At least we have seen that in many cases, yes, ECMO, the longer the patient is on ECMO, uh, especially after seven days, the survival tends to decrease. And that has been, very well documented. Next slide, please. Actually, before you move, actually, you can go back for a second. So what are some of the indications now for TAH that we have talked about that are very important? Is a refractory arrhythmia, the VTVF, the patient who has been ablated four or five times waiting for transplant continues to have arrhythmia. And that, that's a patient that can easily be supported with the TAH. The patient with cardiogenic shock on short-term devices or a temporary device that is not responding. The patient with a VSD, a post-infarction VSD, who is a transplant candidate, those patients can be very easily stabilized with, with a TAH uh, when the VSD is too large or it cannot be uh, repaired either surgically or, or uh, percutaneously. Patient with restrictive uh, physiology like patient with amyloid, the device worked extremely well. And of course, the patient who had a heart transplant years ago now has graft failure, waiting for another heart, who might have a high PRA, for example, who, needs, who might need desensitization therapy. You can re-bridge them, uh, or you can bridge them with a TAH, removing the old graft. And one of the questions that comes often is, what do you do with the immunosuppression? And the answer is just completely stop it and wind the steroids up. Even the steroids in a transplant patient who is not requiring a TH or any device is, is very risky. Next slide, please. So just a quick word on the RV failure score that have been published over the last several years. And these are six of them and they're all well known to us. And my comment here is very simple. The reason why there are six of them is because none of them work. And I have used them independently or in combination, and I have not been able to get good predictability on who's going to develop RV failure after placement of an LVAD. So it's something that is good to have in the back of your mind, but I don't put too much below at 7.9%. Next slide, please. One of the most important takeaways for the total artificial heart, given the current UNOS allocation, is that the patients are UNOS status two, either in the hospital 
or at home once they are discharged with a TAH. Something to keep in the back of your mind. So some more indication for the support with the total artificial heart. The one, the basic ones that we know by ventricular failure, cardiogenic shock. Patient with post cardiotomy failure. And what does that mean? Patients that go to have high risk cardiac surgery, second, third time, fourth time sternotomy with some valvular repair or replacement, bypass grafting, aneurysm resection uh, that failed to win, be win of cardiopulmonary bypass require a short term. We've been able in a very good number of patients be able to do the TH as in those who are candidates for transplantation. Patient with malignant arrhythmia that has been discussed, restrictive, restrictive cardiomyopathy, MI and BSD. Patient with ventricular thrombosis, we've been seeing these more often in the last few years with the use of the short-term devices, especially ECMO. When there is ECMO that is very effective, bypassing the ventricle, we have seen patients who develop either univentricular or biventricular thrombosis, and then that precludes the ability of the heart to recover. A patient with Chagas disease, which is interesting because we have been seeing more and more of these patients in the United States, and they have been reported all the way up in Chicago already. So these are patients that the myocardium is invaded uh, and slowly destroyed, and it's a biventricular destruction of the muscle. So we have utilized the TH in those patients successfully. Again, in the right side, the post transplant vasculopathy in patients who might need a retransplant, LVAT thrombosis and failure. We have done several, and hopefully there will be a manuscript about this in the next, in the in the near future. Or how many patients we, who had received an LVAT initially, have had to be rebridged with a TH, and again the patient with complex congenital heart disease. There have been several reports of cardiac malignancies, and patient with mechanical valves and biventricular failure. It is sometimes so much easier to do a TH in these patients rather than an LVAD and then have to replace some of the mechanical valves. The path to transplant is not clear. The TH provides the best biventricular support there is uh, in one, sim one single device that is very easy to manage. The implantation is fairly easy. The explantation is fairly easy if you protect the device. We have excellent survival to transplantation. That's one I want to thank Dr. Arabia and Copeland for sharing their expertise and passion for the TAH. Uh, an excellent presentation. And, uh, and thanks to everybody who took the time to join the, the presentation tonight. And also a quick thank you to Steve and Joe. We appreciate your input as well all the time.